This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 3, Episode 230 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview amazing entrepreneurs about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we give you some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. I am excited to change it up today. We are answering your questions, questions from our listeners. It's going to be a lot of fun. Whether you are new to Jumble Think or a longtime fan, if you haven't subscribed to the Jumble Think podcast, you should do it right now. It's easy to do. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. And for Apple Podcasts or iTunes, simply go to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. Or for Spotify, jumblethink.com slash Spotify. It'll take you right to the app, right to our page, right to where you can subscribe to our show. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We're doing something different today and answering your questions. We're picking 10 of our favorite questions to answer on today's show. Before we do that, we've got an exciting announcement. We have a brand new partner, a, a sponsor of our podcast. Their name is Penji. Uh, the founder of Penji has been on the podcast in the past, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about them in the weeks to come in future episodes. But I wanted to give you a little taste of what Penji does. Penji helps startups, agencies, and marketing teams achieve more with unlimited graphic design support at one flat monthly rate. Their easy-to-use online platform pairs you with professional designers and lets you create as many design projects as you want for your designer to work on. No contracts, no hourly billing, just fast, simple, and affordable graphic design for you. They have a special offer for our listeners. Use the code JUMBLE to get 15% off your first month with Penji. Now, I uh, recently did a new project with them. I had them design a logo for our upcoming idea camps. I was impressed. They gave us back a couple different ideas in the first round, and we had a winner right in the first round. First uh, stab at designing that logo. It was killer. You can check that out in the episode's notes of today's episode. Simply go on over to jumblethink.com, and you can see that. Speaking of Idea Camps, they are coming up and we want you to be a part of it. Idea Camps help you turn your dreams and ideas into a strategy to make them real. Having dreams and ideas are, it's awesome, but if you don't make them a reality, then they're not really helping you. So we want you to come to Idea Camps. It's a three-day event in October of 2019. To learn more about them, head on over to jumblethink.com slash ideacamps. It's jumblethink.com slash ideacamps. I think you're going to love them. So go sign up right now. By the way, we just lowered our costs for them. Uh, it's much more affordable. You can get tickets as low as $99, and it goes up from there. But we've got some cool things going on there. You want to go check it out. Jumblethink.com slash ideacamps. We also want to thank our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com for sponsoring today's episode. We'll be talking a little bit more about them later in today's episode. Now it's time. We're going to jump into your questions and answer them right now. If you know anything about me and JumbleThink, you know that one of our philosophies is what we call uh, micro experiments. We have a guide called the Dreamer's Guide to Micro Experiments. And so even in our podcast, we try different things, new things to change it up. And today is one of those episodes. Typically on a Friday, you would catch uh, one tip Friday or a topic where we go deep into that topic. We've been doing a series of the power of, and uh, we've done some great episodes about the power of community, the power of wonder, the power of. Um, uh, boredom, and a whole bunch of other topics. Today, we're changing it up a little bit and doing something fun. We are answering your questions, and these questions come from a couple different sources. Some of them are from our social channels like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Some of these questions come from our followers on Quora. Yes, you can find me on Quora, and yes, I do answer questions there. Some of these questions are questions that have come up in conversations, whether with guests or with uh, friends that are friends of the podcast and listeners of the podcast. The questions cover a wide range from ideas and innovation to podcasting and web design and development and even some personal questions. So what I did is I picked some of my favorite questions or questions that I get asked most often. 
I'm going to start and kick this off with a personal question that I get a lot. I get this whether it's at uh, business events that I go to or people that I'm meeting for the first time. One of the questions I hear all the time is, what is something about yourself that nobody knows? Now, I'm going to give two answers to this, but uh, many people know the answers that I'm going to give. These are just really cool answers. I've never shared, I don't think, either of these stories on the, the show, so why not do it today? The first story comes from when I was way younger. I think I was an early teen. It was summertime. I was outside cutting wood with an axe, uh, big logs, cutting up wood for, for fall and winter that we could use in our fireplace. I loved cutting wood, and we would use, you know, big axes and little wedges to break the wood apart. It was a lot of fun. I don't know why I loved it, but I did, and I loved cutting it, so I was out there doing that. My brother, who is a couple years younger than me, came outside to play, and I told him, hey, look, I'm cutting wood. Don't come over here and play. And uh, he went out somewhere else in the yard, and he was playing whatever he was playing. And out of the corner of my eye, a couple minutes later, I see my brother coming, running towards me, but it's too late. I'm already, uh, have the axe in the air. I'm coming down with the axe. He's running towards me. He trips on something, and he Superman flies right under where I'm cutting wood, and the axe comes down, and I cut the tip of my brother's finger off. I wish that... Uh, that never happened, but it did. And so what happened next is he screams like crazy and my mom comes running out. And both my parents had worked uh, as volunteer firefighters and with ambulance crews. And so they knew a lot about first aid and everything like that. My mom's calm, cool and collected. Uh, and my brother's screaming, I'm ready to pass out. And so she says, hey, uh, I'm bringing out a bag here. Go get the tip of the finger. I have to go find it in all the wood. I find the, the tip, put it in there, and drive to the hospital. I remember asking my mom, well, why aren't we calling an ambulance or something like that to go uh, take us to the hospital? And she's like, well, they would do exactly what we're doing, so I'm just going to take us there. It will be quicker. So we get there. They sew on the finger, and uh, all was good until a couple years or a couple weeks later when my brother was uh, forced to take a gym class he wasn't supposed to take in the little tip of the finger, the uh, past the bone, it fell off. But he kept the rest of the finger, and that is the story about how I cut my brother's finger off. Now, uh, that's just one story that many people don't know about me, but here is another. Back when I was in Northern California, this would have been in the early 2000s, I was working at a church, and this church was in a crazy section of Northern California, known for drug addiction, drug dealing, a lot of meth addiction, homelessness, poverty. It was a crazy place, and, and I was working at this church, helping the community, loved being a part of it, loved doing that. Well, one night, it was late at night, a couple of us guys who worked at the church were in the office, and, and my house was across an alley from the office, and so I'm probably like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, walking home from the office, and I go across the alley and I start hearing gunshots and I look down the alley and probably uh, 30 to 50 feet away from me, I see the, the sparks of guns shooting in my direction. It had been a gang, gang just driving through the south side of Orville, shooting down alleys. And here I am standing in the middle of the alley as they're shooting in my direction. I go running back to the office and it had been raining out and it was wet. I hit the linoleum on the inside of the office and I go sliding and uh, and I'm clutching on to this box of life cereal that had been given to me earlier in the day. I go sliding into the office, clutching onto my life as I've been shot at and the guys in the office look at me and they're like, what's going on? We hear the gunshots and of course what they do, they run out the office to go see what's going on. We called the police. The police never showed up because that's the kind of area it was and... Uh, that's the story about how I was holding on to my life while being shot. So those are two little fun stories that uh, I don't get to share often, never shared on this podcast, but that's a little bit about me, something that you probably don't know about me, and I hope you enjoyed those stories. The next question that I'm answering today is about the world of ideas and startups. Of course, that is our passion here at JumbleThink. So the question is, what is are the best ways to think of ideas for a startup. Now, the first thing I'm going to say about this is that for you to have great ideas, you have to have lots of ideas. 
ideas don't always come natural to everyone. And for a lot of people, this is a, a, a tool, a philosophy, a lifestyle that they have to practice to become good at idea creation, idea formation. And so you're not going to just one day sit down um, for most people and just go, I have this great idea, and then it becomes a billion-dollar business. Many of those people who are creating at that level, they're thinking about hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of different ideas throughout an entire year. And they're processing those ideas, and they're exploring and imagining those ideas. One of my favorite tips actually comes from a future guest, uh, James Alcature. He's going to be on the podcast in the next couple of weeks, and we're so excited about that. You've got to check out that episode when he's on. One of his favorite tips about this idea uh, of how to find and create ideas is to take and create a little tablet. He uses a waiter's or waitress's pad, and he just does like what he calls lists of 10, where it's 10 ideas around a specific topic. Like, what are 10 topics uh, that I can write a book about? What are 10 presentations I can give? What are 10 things that drive me nuts about cars? Whatever it is, He's writing these massive lists of 10 things, and he's just doing it all the time throughout the day. I personally actually do this habit in my own life. I have a uh, – it's it's like a moleskin book. It's by a company called Poppin, and I have over uh, 100 and uh, – 100 and – 50 different lists that I've been doing over the this year alone. And so I just go through and do this. And sometimes I revisit a topic. Sometimes I'm just exploring new topics. Sometimes I'll take a topic from one of those topics and then kind of evolve that topic and keep on going. So one of the great ways uh, our best ways to think up ideas for startups is to do that as a habit, to create a little folder or binder or uh, waiter or waitress's pad and just continue to do that. And I've always loved that idea from James. And that's where I would tell you to start. The second thing I would say is um, we've lost our sense of imagination because we know everything in our society. We have every answer at our fingertips through, with our, our cell phones and with uh, our computers, with our tablets. We can get any question answered. And I think that this is actually both good and bad. We depend on those answers. We depend on always knowing that we can find an answer, that we've lost our sense of imagination. And C.S. Lewis talks about this a lot, that one of his goals was in modern society is to reignite imagination in our society. And that's why he wrote some of his books. That's why he approached life the way he approached it. And so I would say tip number two for what are the best ways to think of ideas for startup is to engage your imagination again, to daydream, to just explore the possibilities of the unknown. Instead of trying to find the answer by doing a Google search for everything, maybe imagine solutions and you might come up with the next solution that no one's thought about. Tip number three for what are the best ways to think of ideas for startups? Ask this simple question. What drives you crazy? Maybe it's something that you can't do easily. Maybe it's something that's always breaking. Maybe it's something that uh, it just literally bugs you all the time. Think about that and then come up with solutions for that problem. Explore the possibilities of how you could solve that problem. And that may become your next startup. Maybe you find that you can never get a taxi cab. Right when you want it, when you need it, you have to wait on the corner till one's driving by and you have to hope that you can get their attention and get in that taxi cab. Well, maybe your idea is to say, well, we have cell phones now. What if I create an app that allows taxis to know that they should come to me instead of me trying to track them down? Well, what if I'm not looking for taxi cabs, but just the next driver that happens to be going by, it's going in the same direction. And that's how Uber or Lyft, those questions got asked and they solved it by creating their apps. So find those things that, that bug you and come up with solutions for them. Tip number four, what is something that you've always thought that hasn't been done before? There are things that you go, ah, I wish somebody would solve this question. I wish somebody would create this. 
Well, the way that those things get created is somebody found that there was a missing spot in that space and they created it. So for you, maybe that idea for your next startup is the thing that you see missing from society. Maybe it doesn't bug you. Maybe it doesn't annoy you, but you just go, oh, this is missing and you create it. And now all of a sudden you've solved a problem that people want to uh, invest in, that they want to use your service and you have your startup. So those are just four of many tips I could give you on what are the best ways to think of ideas for a startup. I'd love to hear what you think about. What are your tips for and ideas for how to come up with an idea for a startup? Head on over to your favorite social media channel like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Find this post and put it in the comments. So I'd love to hear what are your tips for ideas for startups. The next question is a really, really good question. It's a question I hear often. It's a question I see on Quora all the time. It's a question that other people we work with as consultants, uh, we get asked this all the time. The question is, I want to start a business, but I don't have any money. What do I do? Well, this is a great question, and there are many things you can do to make this uh, possible. The first thing is, I like to say, what is the, the smallest entry point you have into the product service or message you want to share? It, it's the business that you want to start, but how do you strip that back to the simplest thing people want solved? Then go and just create a free Facebook page or a group or uh, wherever it is that you can connect with your audience and begin to talk about the, the thing that you want to create. You could go into that and say, hey, I'm going to uh, start helping people with their websites. I've built my own website before. I've built lots of websites, and now I'm going to start a business. And you start marketing to that network you already have, the community already around you. And so what is the, the viable product you can offer? Scale that back to the smallest offering and invest at that level to start that dream idea that you have, to start that dream business that you have. Tim Ferriss talks about this in some of his books about uh, make the offer before you have the product. So go out and pre-sell sell it. Sell the product and say, hey, uh, we have an upcoming uh, uh, workshop, an online summit, and uh, you should go sign up for it and pre-sell the offering. It's going to do a couple things. In the world of micro experiments, what we talk about all the time, of course, is that it's going to give you proof of concept, that there is interest, that people want to be a part of it, that people want to do that. And so uh, stripping it back and pre-selling and then making the product, the course, the offering, whatever it is that your business is based on after you have the pre-sales. Of course, you can also go one step further and do crowdfunded campaigns. You can use... Kickstarter and other platforms like Kickstarter to go fund your projects like GoFundMe does with uh, startups. And you could go pre-sell your product if you're doing a product-based offering. And that's a great way to uh, start a business if you don't have any money. So you're funding through the investment of people who believe in what you're doing, that want your product, service, or message, and that they're going to pre-buy what you're doing before you ever even launch it. You can also then go in and start it as a side hustle. Just because you want to start a business doesn't mean it has to be something you do all at once. Maybe you start the business as a side business and then grow the business to where it's self-sustainable and then you can fully go into it. So you keep your standard career, your standard job, and then you come back and you say, you know what? Uh, I've grown the business. It's self-sustainable. This is great. Uh, I'm going to go do that. Now, the last tip I'm going to give you for if you don't have money and you want to start a business is to find investors. Maybe you are willing to do sweat equity. You're going to build the platform. You're going to um, market the pro a product or the service, the, the message. But you find investors who believe in the idea who say, hey, we'll give you the money to front your business for a percentage of the business. And you'll do the work to actually build the business. And so those are some tips for you on if you want to start a business but you don't have any money, what do you do? Now the next question I'm answering because I just found it as a fascinating question uh, that I wanted to answer. So the question was, what does this quote mean? Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. 
Let me quote that quote again. It says, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. At the high level, I think that this quote is all about where are you putting your focus. And where you put your focus will set you up for where you're going to go. I want to work this quote backwards to forward. So the first part of this quote, if we're looking from the end, is small minds discuss people. I see this section, the small minds discuss people, broken into kind of two areas. There's the area of gossip, which is just to feed off of uh, what people think of each other, whether it's somebody you know or that famous celebrity that you want to put down. It's about the gossip in, in the community around uh, talking about each other. So that's camp number one, gossip. Camp number two, within Small Minds Discuss People, I think it can be broken into to two more segments, which is envy, the envy of success, the en envy of possessions, the envy of of, um, of of failure. And so you're looking at that person to uh, either long for what they have, uh, you want their stuff, or you put them down based on what they don't have. And so it's outward focus when you discuss people at that level. It's about what they're doing, what they have, their achievements, their failures. And then the second part of that from that angle is that uh, it's internal. How do I view myself based on how I perceive others? Oh, they have this. I'm not good enough. Oh, they've made success and we start at the same time. I'm a failure. And so it puts value back on us. And I, and I think that this area, if we just focus on discussing people, we limit ourselves. We limit the possibilities of what we could create and we get lost in that place of, of being limited by potential. The second group of people, they are uh, what the quote says, average minds discuss events. This is a little different in that uh, you aren't focused on gossip. You're not focused on uh, wanting or envying others or putting yourself down based on comparison against them. This is about things that are happening. It could be something in Washington with all the politics stuff going on, or it could be something like a tragedy. It could be a sporting event. Any way you look at this, these people are looking and um, being critical, not critical in a negative way, but critical as in critical thinking and talking about the events and how that impacts culture and society. Uh, did you see the game last night? And you're talking, it's common bond. Uh, and, and it goes beyond that gossip level of people. And it now talks about something that's a little bit more constructive. Uh, did you watch that show last night? Did you see the finale of whatever your favorite show is? Uh, did you, uh, what do you think about the movie that you just saw? And so you're talking about events, and so it's, it's beyond critical of criticizing others or judgment, and now it's more about critical thinking and, and processing what you saw, experienced, experienced, felt. And so average minds discuss events. And the final group of people, great minds discuss ideas. And, and the reason that this is so powerful is that great minds discussing ideas, ideas are abstract in nature. So they are a philosophy, they are a thought, they are a concept, they aren't necessarily reality. And so when you're exploring what's not known or the unknown, you begin to have to process that information differently. It's more abstract. Whereas people, it's emotional, it is critical, it is, uh, it is, it is uh, judgmental. Events are experiential and saying, you know, you're basing on fact and, and knowledge and information. Ideas are abstract and they, they force us into a place of imagination, which makes us begin to have our own thoughts, opinions, ideas that are productive. And, and ideas, once moved past the idea, become the powerful place for creating a new future. Whereas if you're discussing events or people, you are stuck in the present and past, ideas propel you into a future that is not yet. That is, could be created, that could be experienced. And so, small minds, uh, I think that what this, this person is talking about is that you're limiting yourself and you're limiting others when you discuss people. Average minds are 
are talking about events, so they're they're talking about experiences, emotions, and what's going on. That's great. Great minds talk about philosophy, the the experience of what could be, and in that they push the boundaries of the accepted. Whereas events and people are accepted, ideas are pushing into that unknown, that place of potential. Uh, I, I don't know what you think, but that's my interpretation of this quote. I find it as a fascinating quote, and uh, maybe we'll talk about it again more sometime in the future. We're going to take a short break here, and in a moment, we're going to be back and answering some more questions. Questions like, if I have an idea for a startup, what are the first things I should do? We're also going to talk about what are some good ideas for a YouTube video I'm going to also answer some questions about what I'm listening to, watching to right now, and uh, some web design and development questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be right back. We want to take a moment and thank our sponsors and friends over at OpportunityInChina.com and Penji. Here's a little bit more from our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com. At the dawn of the 19th century, forward-thinking people moved to the commercial centers of Europe. Moving into the 20th century, America welcomed millions into the land of freedom and opportunity. It is now the 21st century. Many of the successes and fortunes of our generations will be made in China. To learn how you can seize opportunity in China, follow the Opportunity in China podcast. The Opportunity in China podcast is available anywhere podcasts are streamed. Or you can visit our website at opportunityinchina.com. We also want to thank our friends and new sponsors over at Penji for sponsoring today's episode. Penji helps startups, agency, marketing teams, and more achieve great design through unlimited graphic design on a monthly flat rate subscription. They are doing cool stuff. So if you need a logo, a flyer, a social media post designed, maybe even a website uh, redesigned, they are the place to go. I love working with them. Their team is awesome. They're fast, and the designs we get back are perfect. We're going to be talking a lot more about them and all that they're doing. You can get a special first month off discount. That's 15% off your first month's subscription with Penji simply by using the code JUMBLE. So go head on over, Penji.com. That's P-E-N-J-I.com. Go check out what they're doing. We love them. I think you will, too. And don't forget to use our code JUMBLE when you sign up with them. Now let's jump back into today's episode as we go deeper into your questions. Hey, welcome back for more questions from you. If you have a question that you want answered, it's easy to do. You can shoot me an email, hello at jumblethink.com or find us on our social channels. Drop us your question. That way we can answer your questions questions on an upcoming episode of Jumble Think. The next question is, if I have an idea for a startup, what are the first things I should do? Well, there are a lot of things you could do. I don't know if there's a right answer to this. It depends on what your idea is and what your startup is. I would actually not recommend going in and setting up your next S-Corp or LLC or business entity. The first thing I would do is try to figure out if your idea is marketable, if it's profitable, or if it's a business that you can build to actually generate revenue. So the first thing I would do is maybe run a micro-experiment. What's, what micro experiment might I run? Well, here's a great example. Uh, I would I thought it would always be really cool to start a business making craft root beer, sarsaparilla, birch beers, those um, those wonderful non alcoholic beverages, those sodas, those craft sodas, and uh, I could of course go and set up a business, go buy all the equipment and everything like that to say, hey. I'm going to go build this business and hope that there's a market for it. But in this case, what I did is I said, why don't I see if there's interest in a craft root beer company? So what did I do? I went on over to Facebook ads and I set up a couple campaigns to try different ways to reach people and see if we could convert them to click on our ads. So my process for this to test out the idea to see if there was a market there uh, was to first set up the ad on Facebook, second run a campaign. I think I ran three campaigns over the course of six or seven days, and I wanted to see, one, what kind of messaging converted, two, 
did people actually click on it? And three, would they sign up for a newsletter for more information once we were live? So I did that and I found what messaging worked. I found that there was interested in, in interest in that and I decided this was a great idea. Then I stepped back and I said, is this the right time for this idea? My answer was no. Why wasn't it the right time? Well, for me, I was busy. I'm working on this podcast. I have a web agency to run. And so for me, adding another thing, this wasn't the right time. Good idea. We have an audience. Okay, well, it's not the right time. Another thing you could do is that if you're building a, a business, a startup out of passion, sometimes you have an interest in an area and uh, you don't necessarily know if this is a, a, something that you should create into a business. What I mean by that is that just because you like something or an idea of something doesn't mean you actually like it. So let's say I changed it up and instead of seeing if there was a market to look at the business side of starting that root beer company, let's see if I like doing it and if it's fun to do, what would be the steps I would take going that route. So if I wasn't worried so much about the business side, but more about like, is this something I want to do? Well, I would buy some basic equipment to do a small batch of root beer. I'd buy the ingredients. I would make it. I'd try it. I would experiment. Maybe I'd make five or six different batches over the course of three months to try different kinds and styles of root beer to find my own flavor. And I would learn a couple things. One, is it something I like doing? And maybe it's just a hobby, something I do for fun for myself, and I go, this is awesome. Two, I can learn, is this something that I enjoy doing, and I wouldn't mind doing it full time to make it a business? So that's another thing I could find out from that. And the third thing is, is I may learn that uh, by doing this micro brew that uh, it would cost too much money, time, or energy for me to invest into it, or that I could make it sustainable and grow the business. So there's a lot of things I can learn from that experiment about doing it, learning how to do it, learning if I enjoy it, learning if it's something that I could actually sustain and grow business from. So two different things I can do right at the beginning to see if an idea is relevant to making it a startup or making it into a business. Method number one shows me, is there interest? Is there an audience? Method number two shows me, is it something I would like to do and something that I could do and something that would be enjoyable to turn from a passion into a business? So there are two different ideas of what you could do first. The third thing you can do, which is the lowest um, interest point or lowest entry point, is to see what your friends and family think. And so maybe just take a survey of people you trust that know you, that love you. Say, hey, I think I would love to start a craft root beer business. What do you think about that? Would you want that? Do you think other people would like it? Do you think it's a great idea? What kind of market do you think there is for that? And you start dreaming together with the people around you. Uh, and that would be some great next steps that you could take. So any of those would be a great first step. The first step is all about discovery. It's not about building the business. It's all about discovering, is there a market? Is it something I would love or could do? And what do the people around me think about it? So if I were starting a new startup, and if I had an idea for that business, I would step back and just do some discovery. The other thing you could discover is just doing lots of research, reading, uh, watching YouTube videos, watching uh, content that is out there to see is this something that is a passing fad of interest for me or is this something that I'm going to be interested in two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road? Uh, and then that might be an area that you decide to start a business in. Those are real tangible because those are real, you know, rubber meets the road kind of businesses. But if you're more philosophical uh, with starting the next Uber and iterating and innovating in that space, you could run some polls and see if there's interest. You could run a Kickstarter campaign to see if you could run, raise the money to run that business for the first year. So there's all kinds of things you could do, but those are the first ideas that I have for how you could start that startup. The next question, in my opinion, is all about content creation. The question itself is, what are some good ideas for a YouTube video? But let's go one step further. What are good ideas for YouTube channels? What are good ideas for a podcast episode or a podcast show? What are good ideas for a radio show? What are good ideas for a movie? What are good ideas? So 
this is all about understanding the content you should create more than it is about the individual outlet. And so if you're listening, you can apply this to your YouTube channel. You can apply this to your podcast, maybe even a blog. There are multiple outlets you could apply this philosophy to. So what are some good ideas for a piece of content? Well, I would start out by saying um, there's a lot of content out there. And you need to figure out what kind of content is going to differentiate you from the thousand other people that have done a video, a, a podcast, a, a blog, post about whatever. Uh, how are you going to make your content stand out? How is your audience going to connect with it? So you need to be thinking about uh, what what is different about the content you're creating, but also the audience you're serving. Make them your hero. Cater to what they need to hear to connect with it, share it, like it, love it. All of the stuff it does take to make content sustainable. There's a learning process in content creation. And so your first pieces are going to be horrible. I was listening back to some old episodes and uh, there were funny things about those episodes. I went, ah, what was wrong with me? Things like talking differently. So I sounded like I was on radio and instead of just talking like myself, I tried to make my image persona be something it wasn't the more authentic you can be in content creation, the better. So you are going to find that there are things you do two years ago in content creation that you uh, frown upon and you just went, what was wrong with me? And you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. When it comes to topics itself, there are tons of topics. If you're going to an event, maybe it's Comic-Con, maybe it's the Super Bowl, you could do a video that is all about your experience. It could be from a different standpoint. So you could be sharing your stories of Comic-Con as being a vendor. Or what is Comic-Con like if I dress up like Luke Skywalker? Or what is Comic-Con like if I uh, dress up as your favorite anime costume, uh, character in costume? So you could look at it from that point of view and create it from experience. What am I already going to be doing? I'm just going to document my experience. So that's one idea of how you could create content. Uh, you could give a review if you're on a podcast or blog of that event. I remember I went to a conference in L.A. Uh, years ago called Origins, and I posted uh, an article about it somewhere. I don't even remember where. And I found that that actually pushed a lot of content to our website because it was one of the few articles about that conference. It was in a big conference. It was like probably like six or 700 people, but I wrote an article. And so I was actually showing up better than some of the official pages for that event. So that you might want to do that. If it's an obscure event that you're going to, or a niche event, that may be your YouTube video, your podcast or blog uh, post. You may also go a different uh, avenue. Instead of doing an event, you could actually say, what is something that I'm trying to solve that I can't find an answer for? Great example of that. I had a friend who had a specific Cadillac. It was a classic Cadillac, and he couldn't find an answer to a question on how to fix something. Went to all the car mechanics. They couldn't figure it out. And it was a common question and issue that was happening with that specific car, but no one could find an answer or solution for it. So he figured out the solution and he wrote an article about the solution to fixing that problem, which is really powerful. So if you are searching for an answer about how to do something or uh, why you shouldn't do something a specific way or a different approach to solving something, that would be a great idea for a YouTube video. That may be a great uh, idea for an article for your blog. It might be a great idea for an episode for a podcast. The great thing about looking at uh, creating a a video around something that you need to learn and you can't find an answer is that you will actually experience the process and that will make it more real than watching someone else do it. One of the other things you could do is begin to push into imagination. I think that there's a lot of great content that's being created, but it's very factual. This is how you do stuff. Here's a thing to think about. But go more creative than that. And you see this in the podcast space, uh, specifically around like true crime and uh, fiction-based content creation. And there might be a lot of YouTube around that, but you could explore the world from that standpoint and actually create something that is a story you want to tell. And that could be factual. 
could be telling the story biographically or documentary style. It could also be exploring a novel and writing a story to actually present uh, through, through these mediums and through these channels. And one other idea for you to help kind of get the idea juices going on, on content creation is you could also look back to the past. So look to the future and create something, tell a story, but look back on a piece of history or something unknown or not known a lot about. I live near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I used to know a lot about it. I don't remember most of that. But maybe there was something, if I studied all that information again, wasn't really covered in the story of Gettysburg or in the movie of Gettysburg that covers that story or in the books that you see. Maybe it's one little small thing. I remember that there was this one book about Gettysburg and it talked about unknown facts of Gettysburg. And one of those facts was, where can you find dinosaur footprints in Gettysburg? Well, that could be a great video. That could be a great podcast episode. That could be a great article that you go deeper into that, like the unknown facts of the Battle of Gettysburg. Or you see it all the time with Disney, Hidden Mickeys at Disneyland or Disney World. Or you could do a story about the unknown uh, attractions of Disney and things that are a little bit more obscure and hidden. And so these are all ideas of how you could create content, whether it's video, audio, or written, that would be around ideas that are more uh, historical in nature. So those are some great ideas, in my opinion, on uh, what you can create for your next piece of content. We're going to pivot here a little bit more and go into the world of podcasting. If you've been listening specifically for our podcast section, this is it. We're going to answer uh, two questions on podcasting, and I'm going to give you some insights into the world of podcasting that may help you in your own journey. The first question is, what does it take to create a great podcast? I could get real technical here and say, well, you need this kind of software and this kind of mic and this kind of uh uh, hardware and you need this interface, you need these cables, you need these mic stands. And that's a part of it. Yes, you need the technical pieces to create a podcast. And there's a lot of people say that's that you should start with super high-end content uh, that is recorded and sounds polished and you should sound like an NPR podcast. And I actually disagree with that. I think that you should leverage the tools around you to create a podcast and then grow it as you grow your podcast. So one of those hot applications out there is Anchor. And Anchor is a great way to cheaply start a podcast by simply using your iPhone. Now, it is not as robust as being able to edit the episodes and do all of the different elements. And the tool is much different, but it is a great outlet to it. What I would say that you need to focus on for content is three things. One, the audience you're trying to reach. Who is it that you're trying to tell your story to? whether it's a podcast around business, whether it's a podcast around comedy or podcasts about true crime. No matter what it is, know your audience. Know what they want. Know what they need to have in your episodes to actually engage with it and say, I want to listen to this. I must tune in. I need to be a super fan. I need to be connected with this host. So start with your audience. That's mission critical. Step number two to creating a great podcast, create great content. If you understand your audience, then you can create content that both you love and that they connect with. So content creation is awesome. One of the, the bad things I did early on in this podcast was that I had guests on the show that were great guests, but they weren't ones that I was passionate about, and that transferred to our audience not liking them. So if you're doing like a guest show, create the content you want. Bring the guests on that you want. Don't bring people on just because somebody says, hey, you should have my friend Joe on. He's X, Y, and Z, and he's like, you know, the cat's meow. Look at it and figure out, is this a person I really want to talk to? Is this a person my audience really wants to hear from? Is this a topic they really want to know? And that's why we're doing today's episode about questions directly from people that listen to the show. So step one, understand your audience. Step two, content creation. Step three, commit to the long haul. The key benchmarks of a great podcast are often longevity. It's all about working hard. It's all about staying true to what 
you're doing and staying the course. We often in the world of podcasting have a grand picture of how it's going to all come together. And within a month, we're going to be billionaires because we have the best podcast. And now NPR is knocking at our door or any other number of content creation uh, companies, uh, channels are saying, hey, we need your content you got to come work for us. And they're like, here's the check. And that's just not the reality. You need to stay the course. You need to go for the long haul. You may have a great, easy, quick break into the world podcast where you have a podcast that just blows up the charts and you're awesome. The likelihood is that that's not going to happen. I hate to tell you that, but it's true. But if you keep on the course, keep on doing it, your podcast will get better. You'll connect with more people and it will be a great podcast. So Three things. One, understand your audience. Two, create the best content for what you and your audience need. And step three, stay the course, keep doing the work, and be consistent. The next question is, why do you watch true crime shows, podcasts, and documentaries? Well, there are a lot of true crime shows. There are a lot of podcasts I listen to, a lot of documentaries, and I'm going to answer some of that a little bit more about what I'm watching, but why do I like these shows? Well, I think with true crime, who done it, if you will, it's that whole journey of trying to figure out a solution to a question. The question in this case consistently is who killed this person? Who stole this art or money or whatever? And getting through that process of uh, the clues leading from question to answer. I like it because you can learn about a, d- a lot about deduction. You can learn a lot about uh, the process of problem solving from it. I love that it is a process of learning. And documentaries are the same way. It's a process of learning about history or a method or a philosophy of doing something. Podcasts, it's, again, the same thing. It's that constant... Uh, desire to learn. And I find that these pieces of content, these these outlets are great places to learn along the way. And so I love these because they lead through that process, whether it's something like NCIS New Orleans or Psych or Monk or Elementary, that whole process of problem solving. And it's entertaining to see how those people solve the problem and the process to solve it. And with documentaries, uh, there's one about the Iditarod that I just found fascinating because there's a lot of unknowns. You see the race maybe on TV or you read the stories about it, but you don't have the experience of, of the musher and to be along for the ride as they're going with their dogs. And what is that process? What are the risks? What are the trials and and issues that they have to overcome to get to success. And in this case, the success is completing the race. There's a great documentary called I Called Him Morgan, which is about jazz and music. And to hear about the the turmoil of his life and the process of working with great people and being a great musician and his breakthrough and the ups and downs, it, it's something I could empathize with, with the process of success and failure in my own life and to see what worked for him and what didn't work. There's another documentary called Keep On Keeping On, which is about a jazz piano player and his protege and the process of music and creation. And so all of these things lead back to a place of learning. And yes, there's entertainment in it, but the content itself is, is revolving around learning and evolving and growing. Whereas some content is about watching and checking out and and even the true crime stuff, you could do that, watch to check out or even a documentary. So being able to see that content uh, from an analytical standpoint is a learning process. So why do I watch it? I watch it to learn. I watch it to be entertained. I watch it to experience something that I've not experienced to be able to be a part of a story that would be a story I might not be able to be a part of. And so that process is a powerful process in the the story of creation, the story of learning, the story of creating my own story. Going a little bit deeper into the world of podcasting, the question that I had next was, what podcast do you listen to when you are alone? Uh, I listen to podcasts even when I'm not alone or when I'm surrounded by people. Sometimes it's when I'm traveling. Sometimes it's when I am uh, listening to something when the the family's asleep and it's late. Of course, I listen to this podcast. I listen to every episode, believe it or not. One of my favorite podcasts that I I listen to is the James Elkatra Show. I mentioned him earlier with the question about how to get new ideas. 
One of the other podcasts I'm fascinating with, fascinated with is Beyond Bourbon Street. It's all about New Orleans. It's all about going beyond what everyone knows and thinks about New, New Orleans. It's a really fascinating podcast. And then one of the other shows that I love, and, and it's both on NPR and traditional radio and in podcast form, is The Moth, which is all about the art of storytelling and listening to stories of others and the stories they're telling. Uh, I love that, and I find it so powerful to listen to The Moth to learn that process. Those are a couple of my favorite. I listen to a lot more, but if I were to say three podcasts that you should check out, those are it, James Alcatcher, The Moth, and then, of course, Beyond Bourbon Street. Two, uh, tons of different podcasts out there. I've listened to hundreds of podcasts probably now from different spaces and different people, um, and uh Ultimately, for me, it's about finding podcasts that I connect with. And for you, if you're looking for a good podcast, I recommend listening to what is is working for you. Listen to things that you're interested in or challenge you in your current state of life or uh, entertain you. But find content that you really, really, really connect with and engage with that. I would encourage you, too, if you find a podcast you love, Reach out to the podcaster and be like, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to learn more about what you're doing and engage with them on their social channels. It's super encouraging when you have a podcast or when you have a show, when your audience connects with you. So my challenge to you right now is if you're listening, drop me a note. Let me know that you are listening, whether that's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can also drop me an email, mike at jumblethink.com. But I'd love to hear what you think of of the Jumble Think show. And I think we have time for one last question. This question is around the world of web design and development. It's a, a space that I've been working in for years. I've been a web developer for 13 plus years now. I started uh, years and years ago. I've been running my own agency for uh, 11 years now. So it's been a long journey of working in the world of web and web design and graphic design and web development. The question that I am being asked right now is, is it better to create your own website from scratch or use sites like Weebly and Squarespace? I don't think they're really asking this question because if they're talking about building it from scratch, they're talking about either hand coding it with HTML and CSS and JavaScript uh, most likely you're probably, if you're doing a standard website, not like an app-based website or a very complex site, if you're just doing a small standard website, you're probably using some kind of building block for your website. That could be Squarespace, it could be Weebly, it could be Drupal or Joomla or WordPress most likely. Um, and so you're not really ever building a website from scratch most often. Usually you're using those building blocks uh, in our modern age. Now I've built websites completely from scratch from hand code, 100% hand code. I've built websites using WordPress and Drupal. I've used Word, uh, used solutions like Squarespace and uh, Wix to build websites too. Now here's what I would tell you. If you are not a coder and if you are not a person that needs a complex website, then Squarespace or Wix could be great. We personally love Squarespace. It is the platform of choice that we often use for our small business and even some corporate projects. Did you know Pixar is using Squarespace? It's true. It's crazy, but it's true. And, and so there are big companies, corporations that use Squarespace. It is a amazing platform to use. Uh, and for most people, out of the 400 and probably 50, 450 websites now that we've built, a good 85 to 92 percent of those clients could be on Squarespace and have websites that are killer for them. If you need something more advanced, something more customizable that goes past those limitations of those DIY site building tools, you're going to look at something like WordPress or Drupal, and you're going to build and architect your own site using those uh, bare bones tools and assembling a site. Now, there might be some custom coding going on there. Most people are going to pull a paid or free theme. Then they're going to pull modules or plugins, and they're going to build their website that way. So there's not a lot of customization truly going on. Even in the world of web development design, uh, they, there are probably 
uh, for most small business, middle business websites, even if it's commerce and you're using something like Shopify, it's probably not a whole lot of customization and custom coding going on. Now, there might be design updates. And those de design updates are often using like a WYSIWYG or uh, which is a what you see is what you get editor or they're using some kind of uh, design builder where you're not actually typing in code, but you're using a tool to make that. So to the person asking this question, if you are building your own website and there is not a very good reason why you shouldn't use one of those tools, I would say start with Squarespace. Uh, if Squarespace isn't adequate, then look at WordPress or Drupal. If that isn't adequate, then you probably need to hire a robust web developer to work on your project. So that would be my question for you on this process of creating your website. Now, if you're just wanting to learn, I would recommend building some things from scratch, learning how to hand code HTML, uh, learning how to hand code uh, CSS, learning how to work with JavaScript from a direct level instead of trying to learn it from uh, hacks and other things. Learn it, learn it, and know it inside and out. There are still times that by knowing code, I have an advantage of being able to rapidly fix problems that I normally wouldn't be able to fix if I was just relying on the nuts and bolts that I'm taking to build a site with even WordPress or Drupal. So those are our 10 questions for today. As we wrap up today's episode, I wanted to give you some updates on exciting things happening. Next week on the show, our guest is Aaron Smith. Now, Dr. Aaron Smith is a uh, specialist in the world of STEM schools. He has written a book about it. It's super cool, a lot of fun. You're going to love this episode as we talk about how we educate we're going to be talking about curiosity. We're going to be talking about uh, the partnership between education and business and how we can shake up the way and why we learn the way we learn. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to want to check that out. We also have some great guests coming up. In about two weeks, our guest is Martin Duggard. He is a well-respected author. He's written several books. One of the books is called To Be a Runner, How Racing Up Mountains, Running with the Bulls, or Just Taking on a 5K Makes You a Better Person and the World a Better Place. That's going to be a lot of fun to have him on the show. In a couple of weeks, we are going to have James Elkacher on the podcast. We talked about him earlier in the episode and some of his tips. That's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to want to make sure to check out that episode as always, exciting things happening at JumbleThink. One of those things we are super excited about is called Idea Camps. Idea Camps are all about helping you create a path forward to stop dreaming and having ideas to start doing and changing the world by making your ideas and dreams a reality. We have a great event lined up. It's called Idea Camps, of course, and these three-day events are going to network you with other people just like you, dreamers, idea makers, innovators, makers, and... Going beyond that, we're going to teach you some great tools to make your dreams and ideas a reality. And then we're going to take and mastermind directly with you to give you a roadmap to turn those dreams and ideas into reality. We've lowered the prices. We want you there. Head on over to jumblethink.com slash ideacamps, jumblethink.com slash ideacamps to learn more about them. Are you looking for a speaker for your event, whether it's for your team? whether it's at a conference or summit or even something unique and different, well, I would love to be a part of what you are creating and sharing messages that will challenge your audience. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash speaking, jumblethink.com slash speaking to learn more about how I can help you and your audience reach the potential for a better future. We want to thank our sponsors for today's episode, Penji and OpportunityInChina.com. Penji is helping people take and have on-demand graphic design for all of their needs at a low monthly subscription rate. Head on over to Penji.com and use the code JUMBLE to sign up for 15% off your first month. We also want to thank our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com. If you are looking for a new career teaching abroad or learning at a university in Asia, Head on over to OpportunityInChina.com and learn more about how they can help you. As we wrap up today's episode, my final thought for you is this. I've answered 10 questions from people just like you. Maybe they're a listener. Maybe we connect on Quora or on Facebook. But these are questions from real people. Everyone has questions. 
So if you have a question and you don't know how to get it answered, the answer is out there. Ask for help. Ask for the people around you or even reach out to me. I would love to help you on that journey. You will find an answer to your questions and ultimately that will lead you to a place where your dreams and ideas can become reality. So don't hide behind unknowns. Ask the questions you have and get the answers you need. We need you. Dream big and change the world around you. La technique que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.